Hello and welcome to the Mountain Gazette Library. I'm John Boozdar, and this week we proudly present the writings of Peter Cray, writer, editor, and expert on ski trends, education, and on snow innovation. Enjoy. Enjoy the great American West. What's left of it? October on top of Half Dome. The whole Sierra was blanketed with a foot of snow. On. I had just entered a pleasantly empty subway car. And the next thing you know, you're in this calm, calm water. When you know who you are, when you get in touch with yourself, you don't have choices. So I think as a journalist right now, you have a lot of opportunity to really put across quality work that will stand out in a sea of a lot of garbage. If I've learned anything about life balance, it would be that the no balance balance is where it's at. <laughs> Episode 9, Part 1, The Ghost Hotel, Ski Chile, written by Peter Cray for Mountain Gazette, 195. For years, we floated like spirits through the air, on planes headed to Munich, Sapporo, Zurich, Innsbruck, Santiago, Ushuaia, and Vancouver waiting under white lights for skis at the big bay at baggage claim, then catching a train to the mountains or meeting a friend or a shuttle at the curb. We waited for the keys in wood and tile lobbies of hotels, hostels, or pensions, unlocking a room with a bed, a tiny television, and a view. Sometimes we wondered who had slept there before, another skier to look at the mountain like a lover, a rider seeking gigantic silence, or, in our dreams, a tall, smiling girl. The snow and the speed were what we searched for. That single sensation when every moment is the only moment, and the powder, our thoughts, and every breath would burst into the sunlight atmosphere, and every turn was a repeating prayer. At dinner, there was wine and fire, talk about the perfection of the day. The places where we scared ourselves, the slopes where we flew, and all the old jokes we told before. Then again, before we slept, we held on to the warmth of each clear drink at the bar. It was a beautiful life in motion, paced with the calm anticipation awaiting for each new snowfall. But it suddenly stopped when the pandemic hit. Working its way overseas from China and up to the ski towns and tourist stops first, then down to the cities, filling hospitals and closing offices and schools. And everything, eventually. So, on the last flight back to Denver to Santa Fe, I watched my whiskey burn in the setting sun as the light caught fire across the snow-covered Rockies to the west. And I thought of the whole empty planet below like a ghost hotel. When I got home, I kissed my lovely Catherine, my red-haired, green-eyed Scottish sage, and hugged and walked the big black dogs, and found that I had all the time in the world to share this tale. In its entirety, it is a story of the second bankruptcy of an international ski media company, a self-supported cross-country ski race across Greenland, the great American Alpine victories of the 2010 Winter Olympics, in Whistler, British Columbia, and a single clear-eyed epiphany at the check-in counter of the Pollard Hotel in Red Ridge, Montana, where William Jennings Bryant, Buffalo Bill Cody, and Calamity Jane stopped to stay over the years. But for now, its sole focus will stay on the mostly reliable details of her grand South American ski tour turned tragic, and the circumstances that resulted and it taking so long for Frank Long to come home. The Marshal. On September 4th, 2009, in Valle Nevado, Chile, I was standing on the side of a mountain, watching my friend Frank Long ski into an accident that would take his life in two years. The light was flat. Frank was going fast, making beautiful turns, even though it was difficult to gauge the contour of the snow. He never saw the transition from the slope of the run to the sudden shelf of the catwalk. And when he hit it, the immediate deacceleration fractured his back, flipping him out of his skis, which came to a sudden stop and his body arched through the air. Shh. It was the only sound on the mountain. 
and it seemed as if the world stopped turning as he flew down the hill. Eleven years later, I can see it with my eyes wide open, watching it unfold in slow motion until he lands with a puff of powder in the soft snow on the run below. Pete, he told me when I reached him, his pale blue eyes staring up in the gray sky behind me. I think I really hurt myself. I can't remember what I said to him other than some hope for something better and optimistic empathy along with the lines of you'll be all right, it's cool. I was the only one there when it happened. Matt Hansen was already far ahead, telemarketing with long sweeping steps down the bare ridge line he had come to like so much in the three days we had been at Valle Nevado. A Blanco was drinking coffee and reading the paper in the lodge because of a bum knee. We had left the Viking Santiago with his family. And La Femme was behind us, snowboarding up forever, it seemed, after Frank had first started to breathe again, then to cough and groan. I placed his skis on an X on the catwalk to let ski patrol know where to find us. Then slid back down to where he was lying, quiet and thoughtful, as if he just decided to rest on his back and watch the clouds. I don't want to live this way, he finally told me. Then neither of us said anything for a while. Frank was a handsome man, tall and tan, athletic and impeccably groomed. In South America, we had taken to calling him the Marshal because of his cowboy mustache, steely blue eyes and full head of silver hair. When I'd first seen him in the LA airport two weeks earlier with his skis, a white t-shirt and a tweed houndstooth jacket, jeans and Gucci slippers without socks, I'd thought, that guy is a high roller. I bet he jets down to Portillo every year. It was too early for the South American land counter to open and we were the only two people standing there. When he saw my skis, we realized we were on the same media trip organized by the Chilean Tourism Bureau. And we had a hot breakfast together at the Asian noodles counter. The tourism company was giving us the royal treatment. After we checked in, we went to drink espresso in the first class lounge upstairs. The regular elevator that stopped right in front of the bright polished lounge entrance was out of order. So we rode up instead with the maids in the service car. The marshal was a New Englander, now living and skiing in Utah for the past few years. In Lima, we had a stopover at midnight, just when we were really getting to sleep. So we walked around the concourse to stretch our legs, stopping to look at the t-shirts, jewelry, and pastries he called Pogi Bait at the airport stores. Then we reboarded the plane to fly to Santiago, where we met the rest of our crew. It was the third time I had been to Chile, but I had never fallen in love with the country so completely before. Staring off at the blue mountains and the curve of the earth, everything sparkling in the sun as we got drunk on Pisco Sours and felt ourselves making the kinds of memories we would remember until we couldn't remember anymore. Like Lima with the hippies at the stopover all flying to Mexico City, drawling Espanol, Santiago so sleepy in the morning. In the arching flight to Concepcion, the man we drove by, who was carrying a chainsaw along a muddy road, wet chimneys and pops are still bare at the end of the field. Large yards and warm, lazy houses with some project forever incomplete, like the downed tree that needs sawing, some windows to put in, or the rubble along the unfinished wall. And dogs everywhere, all owned by the neighborhoods, wild or just let out that morning for a stroll. Chile is a good place to be a dog, one of the Jedi street dogs of South America. The pure strays forage in the alleyways and parks or are fed by the restaurants at night, while the neighborhood dogs look to the shopkeepers and Los Vecinos for shelter and food. They cross at the light with the people and sleep on the sawdust the shopkeepers throw in the doorways 
when it rains or snows. Christina Schreck, our host, an American expatriate living in Chile, said one year there was an edict for a neighborhood in Santiago to put down the unclaimed strays, and that the day before it happened, the policemen in that district all took their favorites home. Chill on. We drove to the mountains as spring began to come to the valley and to the city of Chilan on our way to Termas de Chilan Ski Hill, our first stop on the two-week tour. The grass was greening, willows were growing fresh buds, and the little apple trees were starting to flower. There were small shrines to people who had died in automobile accidents, families carrying plastic bags filled with big bottles of soda, chips, and meat, then endless vineyards that made you dizzy if you stared. The trees bunched in as the mountains began to rise, first round and brown, then as white as teeth, up to the sky until there was nowhere else to go. The gravel road up to Termas de Chorlan was as bumpy and wide as a logging trail. The building seemed rustic and cozy, big wood cabins and dark little condos, except for the hotel where we stayed, which is modern and elegant, built of glass and stone, with a brand new casino, where not a single person was gaming because all the tourists from Brazil had been scared off by an aggressive wave of flu. The lifts were a hodgepodge of options to get onto the mountain, creaking old red painted double chairs going off in different directions until the summit chair took you straight to the top, where we ducked the ropes and dropped down toward the gullies where the pitch was the steepest. Above the chasm of stinking mineral springs, where we would almost certainly die in a terrain trap if we were caught in the slough of soft snow. We talked about that later at the dinner table, because we knew we had been fools. We should wear our transceivers tomorrow, and I'll ski with a shovel. Then there was wine to drink, fried conger to eat, and the first of the Pisco Sours. The first sense of how we were all some mix of sociable loners, equally proud and flawed, all alpine outcasts in search of motion, snow, and some new stories to tell. It was the Viking who gave us all our names. Morton, a tall Danish photographer and former model who had a Chilean wife, a little boy, and an apartment in Santiago. He had named Frank the Marshal. Matt Hansen from Powder Magazine became Jack because of his resemblance to Jack Nicholson. I was Chevy because Morton said I reminded him of the comedian Chevy Chase, something I still don't see. David Gibson, the editor of Snow Magazine, a luxury title all flush with photos of endless chalets and long-legged women in furs, was El Blanco on account of his lily-white skin and frost-white hair. Christina was la femme because she was the only woman and because none of us was clever enough to think of a better nickname. And Jonathan, or Little Woodward, who was with us only for the first night, was a writer from Boston, who had also started a family in Chile. Early the next morning, he would take the train home to Santiago because his baby daughter had pneumonia. I woke up when I heard his door close and the footsteps in the hall. We had stayed up late that first night in the room we had shared with the Viking, like college, with a bottle of rum and smoke everywhere. Little Woodward was holding court, telling us how he didn't write for American papers except for the New York Times because they were the only ones that paid for real journalism anymore. He said the Guardian in the UK and the papers in Australia and even South America were more likely to publish his stories about the bug man, the par excellence of South American kidnapping negotiator who had made everyone relax kidnappers, victims, and their family alike, because he always made the deal. Or the time he attended Blackwater Convention, a kind of mercenary trade school, and wrote How to Finance Your Own Coup, specking out the cost of overtaking a small African country, from how many helicopters and armored vehicles he would need, to which nationality of mercenaries he would use. But when he started in about the Quaker nudist camps, he had attended as a teenager, describing the sight of the other young campers, white breasts swaying in the sunlight as they picked wildflowers, I had to call bullshit out loud. No, I've heard of them, said El Blanco, straight faced. So I couldn't tell if he really had or was just in on the joke. Quaker sex camp, Hansen said. 
pouring more rum as he smiled. Termas de Chilon. I was on assignment for Ski Press, the magazine where I had worked for 10 years, with offices in Montreal, Munich, and Laguna Beach, California. For a couple of years, it had been the biggest ski magazine in the world. But the company was hemorrhaging money. I hadn't been paid for months, and Jean-Marc Blaise, the owner, would declare the magazine's second bankruptcy at the end of the year. I didn't know if we would even print our annual ski buyer's guide in the fall. With reviews from more than a hundred ski testers from Mont St. Anne to Whistler. So I started posting as much content as I could on the website as soon as I got to Chile. Little travelogues intended to encourage others to travel there and kind of paying for my trip as well. The first post went up after our second day on the hill at Termas de Chilan, where it seemed nobody actually lived, with only a couple standalone houses, a forest service outfit and the local legend of the general who'd ordered his men to keep marching across the high jagged hills until the teeth of the nightmarish winter storm. Separated, freezing, and suffocating in the blizzard, they were buried by the dozen, not to be dug out until the spring, the story goes. We had no such powder, just good sun, and, again, that feeling of something wonderful beginning for all of us to share. Chile to ski. Termas Jalan. At Termas Chilan in Chile, we arced down off piss snow, just going to corn and ride chairs named El Condor and El Fresco up in the wild blue yonder. The runs are open and empty, treeless and hardly tracked. And the views of volcanoes like Antuco, the jagged peaks, white capped slopes seem to stretch away across the Andes forever. Matt Hansen at Powder Magazine skis up after setting some two dozen symmetrical telly turns down another long ramp of snow and says, this must be unreal right after a storm. Just one day ago, I'd waken up in sweat, knowing it was going to be 90 degrees by noon, went to put my skis on the car. At the airport, they set me apart. People stared. They were going to work or back to school, commuting to Houston, Chicago, or Atlanta. I was turning the world upside down to find snow in August, flying to South America. The man with the ponytail who stopped me looked almost forlorn when he asked, So, the skiing is really good right now? There was fine wine on the plane, dozens of movies I never saw at the theater, and since six at night in Santiago is six at night in New York City, I didn't feel the panic to try to go get some sleep right away. There would be no jet lag. By noon the next day, I had just finished a steak and an espresso and was boarding my first chair. Frank Long rode with me. He smiled and said, I wonder what the rich people are doing right now. He said he saw tickets from LA to Santiago for $300 and that with food and lifts and sharing a condo, someone could easily live on $125 a day if they wanted to. At Termas Chilan, I imagine it could be even cheaper. The southern area still seems so undiscovered, a little sleeping giant like Powder Mountain in Utah or Canada's Fernie 15 years earlier. The extra one hour hop of a flight from Santiago to Concepcion is enough of a barrier to ensure that there are hardly any North American skiers, which meant the off pissed snow was essentially undisturbed. That the Canadian film crew we met could shoot long, tracking shots of skiers zooming across empty snow without ever capturing anyone but their models in the frame. And that the happy table across from us filled with dark haired beautiful people dressed up for a night on the town were all Brazilian soap opera stars. They can get away here, Christina Shrek of Ski Chile told me. They come to ski but also mostly for the spa. The thermally warmed waters flow down from the volcanoes and fill the spring-fed pools. You can smell the sulfur, mixed with the occasional waft of wood smoke blowing through the air. The next morning, the steam was rising, as from morning ponds as we boarded the chairs. Our afternoon was becoming clear. Via Las Trancas. Matt, the marshal, and I bonded instantly. The three American skiers, pushing each other from the start, with Matt making fluid, free heel arcs and the marshal almost floating away with powerful GS turns. On the chair, he talked about his passion for boats and being on the water, 
fly fishing, and fast cars. The time he became an instant folk hero at a big mountain competition at Snowbird, for plying all the competitors with cold beer. The Marshall's friend David Johnson, a well-traveled ski guide whom everyone called Gomez, was waiting for us at the bar. He gave Frank a Casa tourist hat that he wore for the rest of the trip and said to Marshall, I told you that you would love it here. At a lodge in the valley, we had dinner with Jerome Baule, a French-American snowboarder who in 2013 would be the only person to survive a massive avalanche on Colorado's Loveland Pass that killed five other riders, the state's deadliest slide in 50 years. I felt sure I would run into him because I remembered him telling me stories about a place just like this. And then there he was, pouring me a taste of some famous French liqueur they had hidden in a dark blue bottle under the bar, then passing a joint around on the way to the pub, which is, I'm certain, where I picked up a head cold. At the snow pub and restaurant in Via Las Trancas, with all the hippie shredders and young girls, I drank Pisco on ice and El Blanco had whatever was in the dustiest bottle. His go-to international bar move, while Matt and Marshall drank beer after beer. I was tired and asked La Femme if there was a cab I could hire back to my room. She shook her head and said she wanted to smoke and have another drink. And when I pointed out the TV with the video of Queen live at Wembley, she pointed at Freddie Mercury. You had the same teeth, she said. I never heard that before, but as soon as she said it, I knew it was true. The same way I didn't look like Chevy Chase and I spent the next week trying to look at myself sideways to see the dental curve in the mirror. The next day, I wrote about how the South American expatriates I was traveling with thought that Colombia was much safer now. That little Woodward had flown into the airport at Medellin on assignment once with an ounce of weed and a bag of cocaine because he was sure he wouldn't be searched. Who brings drugs to Colombia? But I didn't think that was the most family-friendly of ski fare. Chile to soak. Tadamas de Chalan, the one question I can guarantee no one will ask me when I get home from skiing Chile is, so how is the spa? Everyone will want to know about the powder, the wine, and the food, but no one will ask about hitting the pool. Dude, you can swim anywhere, they probably say. Not like this would be my reply. Not with the warm thermal springs spilling down from the mountains and those mountains hovering above us as white, bald, and magnificent as some far southern mammoth or squaw. Not with some giant viking riding the bubble lounge beside me saying there is nothing as tempting in the mountain as a heated pool. Marinating in blue water beneath a blue sky, the viking tells me that the second best day he ever had on skis was when he rode up the gondola to ski the Hachingkam in Austria at Kitzbühel. And the best day? He closes his eyes so that I think he must not have heard the question. But when he opens them, he says, it was here. He says it rained two days, and then it snowed for two days, and then it just stopped. And by nine, we were on the chair. Were there crowds? No, he says. There was nobody here. The Ghost of Chile. I was drinking beer with a Viking when a little Woodward sent me an email from Santiago saying he had left a bag of weed in a vase in the hall. The rest of the rum, too. The Viking and I smoked out of a beer can, punched with holes for a bowl, poured two tall drinks, and went down to soak in the pool. My buddy Harry, the horse from Toronto, would do the same thing in Whistler, British Columbia, hiding perfectly rolled joints in the pottery in the lobbies of the best hotels, like the Pan Pacific and Chateau Whistler, and long brown vases so you had to wait until the concierge and the bellman were looking away to dump it in your hand, then ahead for a room. Once the horse left in a big bowl on the second shelf in the Delta Suites, where my college friend C.D. and I passed out drinking reposado while watching hockey, and when I woke up, my glass was still in my lap, unspilled. My brother Jeffrey was there with his friend George that year, staying at the Pan Pacific. 
And it was well past midnight when CD went out in the hall and came back 20 minutes later and told my brother, nobody on this floor has a lighter. Believe me, I asked, I know. So I am always curious about the things that may or may not be happening in the mountain town hotels. The lives and dramas and beginnings, endings and in-betweenings that are occurring right besides us, but we never know. How right from the start in Chile, there was this feeling someone wasn't there. Some lack of someone besides little Woodward, who was with us at the very beginning, but had gone. And none of us could remember where. Counting heads in the van and wondering if we shouldn't wait a little longer for them to show. That and the realization of August on the opposite end of the hemisphere. Earth's heads or tails. As if there was some deep powder party you kept missing every year. The rain through June and all the snow up high. And on the flip side, the immediate belief that it cannot really be Christmas in December. Not without the cold and snow, how the red and green lights shine brighter in the cold night air. I believe the best holidays are when it's cold. That Christmas needs winter the way faith needs a soul. It is the natural intangible of what you feel. It is why we kept asking each other about the guy we were missing at the bar and on the chair, trying to remember exactly who it was that wasn't there. When I finally brought it up, it was like an unsaid secret we all shared. It turned out we had all been looking for that guy. And everyone said, that's weird because I felt it too, but he was never here. So when the marshal went down and we drove away from the mountain at Valle Navado, where the road falls into eternity to steep mountain meadows with no trees and no snow, we looked around and knew exactly who was gone. And it was as if we all said, well, now we are missing too. El Mercado. At El Mercado in Cholan, I almost bought a pair of silver spurs that would have looked perfect above my adobe fireplace next to the big white candles and smooth rocks I find in the Arroyo. I wish that I had bought them right away. Matt bought a hot sauce and a Coke bottle. And the marshal and the Viking strolled the aisles together like big cowboys just desaddling in some southern town. The barber man and his Scandinavian sidekick, with me taking pictures of the boxes filled with shiny olives, the tables of chopping fish, and the steaming white bowls of stew. I was reluctant to eat because we were in a van and in a hurry, even as I remembered Anthony Bourdain saying of street vendors, of course I eat at the stalls. These people would go out of business if they sickened their neighbors. And because of some fear of being haggled, absurd as that sounds, even for a couple of dollars, I didn't want to be a fool. If I was buying any of these things in America, I would be glad to pay more. Particularly if there were a price tag and I knew that everyone, especially Mr. USA, was getting the same deal. Instead, I paid 20 pesos to take a pee and stopped to take a photo of a shaggy red dog who seemed to know his way around the stalls. He walked besides an old man in an overcoat with a cane. The man wanted me to take another picture, inviting the dog to jump against his chest and holding onto his paws. There were shirts that said Chile, the names of local soccer teams sewn on caps, sewn on caps, little carved knickknacks, and across the street, the carniceria, with the big choice cuts of pig and cow. The vendor holding a string of sausage for a photo, the pig's head beneath the glass, the rain, and how I was glad to have my coat against the cold. There were dogs outside the airport. One of them was sleeping next to the door. We passed out of the clouds so quickly that the mountains rose up in white jagged spires with a height that was astonishing to see, bare and magic and filled with granite folds. A white-haired American in a blue blazer and red tie behind me was telling Hansen that Ted Kennedy had died. He was reading it in Spanish in the paper. He looked as if he had been a friend of the Kennedys, and I wondered what he was doing in Concepcion. 
We got in another van and stopped at a gas station just outside of Santiago before the vineyards and orchards that stretch up the first brown mountains in endless rows. I bought some spice nuts at the gas station and the marshal went across the parking lot to the McDonald's and got a quarter pounder with cheese. I watched him eat it out of the corner of my eye and was jealous that I didn't get one too. That was good, but it gave me heartburn. Three days later, when we stopped there again, we all went for Big Macs and Cokes. After that, La Femme started sharing stories about Hollywood stars. She often worked with North American and European celebrities in South America on vacation and talked about a famous actress and her now former rock star husband. So precious, she said, changing their minds 10 times in an hour. They thought it was the greatest gift anyone could ever give for them to share a little slice of their world. And despite the fact that I really like her acting, I said, I think she just sits around thinking about how cool it is to be her. I thought of the drama class girls I had a crush on in school, the way they commanded a scene and seemed so mysterious and sure. But then they were playing a part any time you tried to talk to them alone. So you never felt certain what was real. That mild nausea, like from sitting in the back of the van with the big rigs everywhere. On the road almost to Argentina, as the mountains got higher quickly after a last stretch of orchards and the hills were increasingly bare. Those are apple trees, right? No, they're pears. Look at how white and gnarled. I heard avocados have become so valuable they have to search the workers at the end of the day and the fields are ringed with barbed wire. So Chile has apples, pears, avocados, and lithium. What else do we get from here? We drove past an army obstacle course and a giant concrete saint with her thick arms beseeching the sky. There was an Escuela de Militaria with white barracks and white statue of a soldier with skis over his shoulder. The river was green and rocky. There were plastic bottles filled with piss on the side of the road from truckers mostly, relieving themselves before the high climb into the hills. There were workers in blue jumpsuits shoveling asphalt in the cliff-broken chasm where some Chilean hero allegedly outran his pursuers by jumping across the astounding gap on his horse. It does not look impossible, but the sight of it makes your stomach fall. Yeah, I don't know. You could do some crazy shit when you're scared. There was the bag of weed that made it with us from Termas, but no one said how. The roadside liquor store where the marshal and I bought bottles of red wine to drink in our rooms, Casiero del Diablo, because we felt it was our turn to host the party. And the truckers from Paraguay in line behind us hauling one of those two tank gas trailers who bought three cases of beer. The roadside restaurant where we stopped for the best empanadas where La Femme said, I get some every time I come to Portillo. They were made of baked beans, shredded beef, olive, and half a hard-boiled egg. And we watched as they were transferred from one brown bag to a smaller one, all wrapped and ready to go. Then ate them as our driver passed idling lines of trucks, once just missing the oncoming traffic on the narrow mountain road. Empanada? In La Pan? In the bread. El Blanco and I agreed. Sure, we were becoming locals now, relaxing in each other's company, craning our necks to see the mountains around the next curve, then under the lowest chairlift approaching the ski area, with the truckers dropping gears and spewing chuffs of black smoke. We tried to see up the jackknifed chute of the super sea, where the chute disappears into the granite walls, to find the trapeze-styled Raka jacklift on the hill, hanging off an elaborate pulley system where constant avalanches would have wiped out a traditional chair. Then we drove into the parking lot filled with super fit skiers from around the world and walked down the stone stairs to swing open the heavy wooden doors and step into the country yard sized lobby 
and comfortable castle setting of the famous Grand Hotel Portillo. Portillo. I started writing this in my beautiful room with the corner balcony looking out onto the lake and hot tub and pool below. I had a feeling of nothing but the snow around me, like some sort of Robinson Crusoe, snow wrecked in Shangri-La. And I think I slept better than I did anywhere else. I could see the snow covered huts and little lodges and the rock a jack lift where I walked around the corner. I thought of my old friend Johnny Selkowitz, the ski race photographer who said Portillo is his favorite place on earth, spending weeks there every summer to shoot pictures of the professional racers, sharing stories of certain athletes and certain storms. Then I finished a copy downstairs in the grand central study with the big fireplace and everyone drinking cups of chocolate and pisco sours coming up on the iron gated elevators manned by men in gold button jackets or the stairs from the stone floored lobby below. I thought of how much better we are when we are proud of what we do, of how it felt in the grand dining room with the wine and food and a warm bed waiting upstairs. I wondered about how many people come down each year to create some immortal art out of falling down a hill, to drink red wine when it's cold and wear warm clothes. How much better it felt in the dining room than at any other dining room at any ski area on the planet, just because of how proud everyone working there was of what they do. Chile, Feliz Cuplianos, Portillo. Portillo, Chile. High in the Chilean Andes at the very edge of the Argentina border, the Grand Yellow Hotel of Portillo is like the United Nations of skiing. Inside its grand hall, American extreme ski legends like Rick Armstrong and Chris Davenport plot nail-biting descents from atop the rugged peaks while families from Brazil, England, and Aspen sip pisco sours in the expansive community room on the second floor. Ski teams from Austria race gates along American gold medalists like Ted Leggetti and World Cup champion Lindsey Vaughn. And the memories of Bode Miller, Picabo Street, and the 1960s photo shoots for Vogue Line, The Storied Walls. Along with the 60 years of tradition, Portillo has always stayed on the top of what's going on in the sport of skiing, says so Portillo's Ellen Purcell. She explains that the hotel is quietly celebrating its 60th birthday because despite its grand history, it is also a place that people seem to discover every year. This place is such an opposite experience to the corporate ski vacation, she says. We celebrate what skiing used to be like with the community and the shared experience. And that seems to touch something inside the people who come here. With no TVs in the rooms and two separate assigned seatings for dinner, guests tend to congregate around the fireplace in the heated pool overlooking the lake of the Incas and the cavernous gymnasium in the basement, striking up conversations with skiers from every corner of the world. Although the region has been hosting ski clubs for more than a century, the hotel itself was inaugurated in 1949, but it wasn't until 1961 when then hotel manager Henry Purcell, who later purchased the hotel from his uncle Bob and who recently turned operations over to his son, Michael, invited ski dignitaries like ski and tennis innovator Howard Head and Alta Utah founder Alf Engen out for a visit that the iconic structure began to establish its role at the center of summer skiing. From America, there are families that come every August to ski fine Chilean powder or to roast raccoon tans to wear back to school. Guides like Dick Johnson from Colorado and genuine guide gear owner Oliver Steffen from British Columbia came to test Alpine touring bindings on the formidable slopes that rise up above 14,000 feet beyond the chairs. It is a special place, says Jackson. The terrain here is incredible, and it's great to be skiing right now. 
At night, the entire hotel community is self-contained, sailing like a cruise ship beneath Chilean stars. There is a band in the bar, and people begin to find their groove legs in the disco downstairs. Ping pong tournaments are starting, books are being read, and new and old friends are creating more memories to share. It is a place that every skier should visit at least once to make a powder pilgrimage, if you will. And because it's so nice to know that even in August, the heart of skiing is beating in South America. Happy birthday, Portillo. Here's to 60 more. The Mountain Gazette Library is produced and hosted by me, John Boostar. For more, head over to mountaingazette.com slash subscribe today and pick up a subscription to the magazine. This podcast is executive produced by Mike Rogie, marketing by Austin Holt, produced by Connor Sedmak, social media by Amy Doran, and public relations by Ryan Rowe. No part of this podcast may be reproduced without written permission from Mountain Gazette and its parent company, Verb Cabin, LLC.